Uh, good morning to everyone. I'm Mike Van Dusen, the Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and I want to welcome you to this um, living memorial to the 28th President. Uh, Jane Harmon is our President and uh, CEO. Uh, she regrets very much she couldn't be here um, this morning. She is on Capitol Hill um, as a former member of the House Intelligence Committee meeting with this Intelligence Committee leadership on uh, on some issues, and um, uh, but very much wanted to be here for a variety of reasons, particularly since uh, she worked in the Senate and early in her career with Senator John Tunney from California at a time when uh, Scoop Jackson was a very central figure in that institution. And um, uh, 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 I know you um, have are looking at a very um, uh, important uh, subject today, and I hope you have a stimulating dialogue. Uh, I certainly want to start by acknowledging the collaboration of our partner in this venture, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. Um, this is the fourth annual, I guess, conference that we, the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute, um, has had here in Washington with the foundation. Uh, we value this collaborative relationship. I think we benefit from it, and we hope that the foundation and um, uh, others in, in, in Seattle do as, as well. I especially want to thank the foundation's um, president, John Hempelman, who's here, and his executive director, uh, Lara Eglickson, um, uh, not only for their work with us, uh, but also for their uh, important leadership over the e many years at the uh, Jackson Foundation on Human Rights in Russia and elsewhere. I would also note that we are joined by some members of the uh, Jackson Foundation Board, and I'd like to welcome them here at the Center today as, uh, as well. Uh, and I should also mention two members of the Kennan Institute staff that have been instrumental in putting this conference together with you, and Joe Dressen and Will Pomerantz, Will being on the stage, and Joe right down here in, in front. In a moment, you'll hear from both uh, John Hempelman and Laura Glickson about the issues this conference will address. Uh, but I want to uh, start the morning by saying how important we in the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, view it to have conversations on issues such as this is great uh, of great importance. Um, Will um, uh, Pomerantz on our uh, uh, staff of the center is a is a lawyer with experience in 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 Russia and has had a special interest in emphasizing some of the uh, legal issues of our relationship and uh, the importance of the rule of law. Um, I um, might mention. Another event that we're having this week that might be of interest uh, to some of you, and you're certainly welcome to, to come. And tomorrow night, uh, we will have uh, the American, I guess, uh, premiere of a, of a play entitled One Hour 18, uh, which is the, the uh, Magnitsky case, a uh, case which is of extraordinary concern to many Americans, including several members of the United States uh, Senate. Uh, that have taken a special interest uh, in it. At any rate, the premiere of this play will be held here tomorrow night <coughs> at uh, 6 o'clock, and uh, you, are, you are welcome to participate, but maybe tell the uh, Kennan Institute if you'd like to come. Um, today, w you are uh, uh, engaged in a very important conversation about the rule of law of Russia. Uh, and whether it is or is not being influenced through its participation with European institutions and what it means for us in the United States. And today's speakers, a group of experts and scholars from Russia, Europe, and the United States uh, are exactly the right people uh, to address this important topic. So I hope you have a very good day. You are all welcome at the Woodrow Wilson Center at any time. And again, a special thanks to the Henry Jackson Foundation for its, um, its leadership and for continuing partnership with the center. Thank you very much. Have a good day. John, Thank it's you your much. turn. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone, and on behalf of the uh, Board of Governors of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, I want to also welcome you to uh, the conference today. 
um, which is a terrific partnership between uh, the foundation and the Cannon Institute. Um, I'm a Seattle lawyer who has the great privilege uh, as serving as the president of the Jackson Foundation Board um, and trace my relationship with the senator all the way back to uh, when I was a student at Georgetown and worked for the senator uh, from 1960 to 1967 and then in his presidential campaigns in 1972 and 1976. Um, since 1983, uh, the foundation has sought to continue the work and the legacy of Senator Henry M. We call him Scoop Jackson. Uh, and we do this through lots of special programs and through grants we provide that uh, uh, provide for activity in the areas of interest in which Senator Jackson was prominent. And one of those very important areas is the, the area of human rights. And we've supported the development of human rights, the protection of human rights, uh, and the development of a civil society um, in the USSR since the waning days of the USSR in 1989. And we continue that work right up to today. That's why we're here. Um, our close working relationship with the Cannon Institute um, has gone back several years. We found uh, that our missions frequently overlap as we seek to uh, educate and inform policy making and scholarly and uh, foundation communities regarding the protection of human rights and uh, creation of a civil society in Russia. You know, both uh, the Jackson Foundation and the Kennan Institute um, were established to honor great states statesmen, uh, George Kennan and Scoop Jackson. Um, each of those men stood for very clear ideological and philosophical approaches to the USSR. And Though they lived in different eras, um, they are two of the, the central figures in U.S.-Soviet relations. Um, and it's, it's fascinating that, that those two legacies bring the Cannon Institute and the Jackson Foundation together on this subject that we're discussing today. We had a, a terrific session yesterday up on the Hill with congressional staffers as we began to look at uh, the impact of the European Court of Human Rights on human rights and uh, a civil society in Russia. And um, we look forward to today's conference to take that discussion uh, to the next level. And so we're very happy to be partner partnering with uh, Mike and, and Will and Blair and Joe um, in producing this, this meeting today. I'd also like, if I could now, just to introduce my colleague, uh, Laura Iglitsen is the executive director of the Jackson Foundation. Um, she runs um, along with uh, Laura Mapp and uh, Yelena Yokovich, runs the foundation in Seattle. Um, this is our second trip to Washington in uh, five weeks. We were here last month on, a, on another subject over at Brookings. <coughs> and so, uh, as I like to tell people, there are not many uh, former or deceased U.S. senators that have a foundation that is anywhere near as active as this foundation, and a lot of that uh, is because of the work of Laura. So, Laura, would you step up and provide a few comments? Thank you. Thanks, John. Good morning. Well, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, the Kennan Institute and the Jackson Foundation put on a, another conference, and there we explored the legacy of the Jackson-Vanik Amendment and, and its relationship to Russia today. One of the clear lessons that emerged from that conference is that legislative tools such as Jackson-Vanik, which were so powerful in their time and which sought results by applying moral pressure on the Soviet Union can no longer be as effective in influencing what's going on in, in Russia today, and specifically on Russia policy toward human rights. So while Jackson Vanek played its role really amazingly well, and uh, over a million and a half uh, minorities and, and Jews and other ethnic minorities uh, emigrated uh, under the banner of Jackson Vanek during the U.S.-Soviet era, Today, new approaches are called for, and that's the reason we wanted to, to do this conference today. One direction that emerged clearly as we talked last year was that 
Washington, D.C. hasn't focused as much on one really important tool that is um, relevant today in human rights, which is Russia's participation in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, as part of its membership in the Council of Europe. It's to better understand what this means in this approach in influencing Russian policy that we organize the conference today where we will assess the role of the court as what we believe is an engine of integration into Europe. By any measure, Russia has presented the European court with any number of challenges, uh, including the sheer overwhelming number of court cases that have overloaded the docket of the European court. And many believe strongly that Russia is merely content to pay the fines that are levied against it when it loses its cases and ignore the broader uh, political and legal principles that are inherent in these judgments against it. But others argue that Russia's uh, membership in the Council of Europe will eventually or even now is proving to be a positive influence on the rule of law in, in Russia. So in the first panel, we hope to kind of more generally shed light on Russia's relationship with the court with an eye as to whether or not it really we are seeing a positive or a negative impact on Russia's development of rule of law. How has Russia reacted to this external impact on its uh, judicial affairs. Our second panel explores the Russian, the specific Russian experience before the court and looks at the record of its cases as well as how well it's implemented the court decisions. We also want to hear specifically how the NGO community in Russia thinks that Russia is doing vis-a-vis -vis the court. Finally, in our third panel, we'll assess the impact of the court on U.S.-Russian relations and U.S. human rights policy, as well as on Russian law and legal institutions. So we hope that what emerges from today's conference will help us determine an effective role for monitoring human rights in Russia as we move past the Jackson Vanek era. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. So as Laura said, the, uh, the first panel here uh, in front of you is going to kind of be uh, European Court 101. And I'm going to give you uh, 60 seconds of uh, the most basic facts. The uh, Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, which is better known as the European Convention of Human Rights, was uh, open for signature in Rome in November of 1950. And it entered into force in September of 1953. Um, Russia signed the convention in February of 1996 when it joined the Council of Europe. Um, some of the numbers about the Russian cases in front of the European Court are really astounding. Right now, as well as of January of this year, there were 40,300 cases pending, Russian-related cases pending before the European Court. Um, the vast majority of those cases in the past um, were inadmissible decisions or inadmissibility decisions. But where the cases were heard on the merits, um, the total number of judgments entered uh, in Russia cases were, were as of January this year was 1,079. The number that's uh, just astounding is that the number of violation judgments, so violation of uh, the, uh, the convention was 1,019. That's almost 95 percent. Um, that's a, obviously a, a disturbing number that we'll hear more about this morning. Our first uh, panelist uh, to my right is uh, Joanna Evans, and she is a barrister uh, from uh, the United Kingdom. I see you've got a lawyer there, a lawyer here, a lawyer here, and an <laughs> activist, <laughs> not, not a human rights worker. <laughs> uh, Joanna has uh, uh, practiced law and um, in, in civil, primarily criminal law in the United Kingdom uh, for many years, but now most of her practice involves uh, international tribunals. Um, Anton and I were talking this morning about the fact it's very rare that you get to argue a case uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but Joanna got to argue a case in front of the Grand Chamber. That is the big 
judge uh, the highest the highest body uh, in the European Court, and so um, she's also a, a, a judge in uh, the United Kingdom. So, um, Judge Evans, <laughs> go ahead. <It's> about time. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I start by saying uh, what a pleasure it is to be here? My my very first visit to uh, Washington D.C. was almost exactly 10 years ago when I came here to work, as it happens, um, temporarily for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So there's a, a kind of symmetry to be here today talking about the, the European counterpart of that body. Sorry. Um, and fell in love with DC at that time. So it's, it's always a great joy to, to come back to such a vibrant city with so many um, incredible resources, people, institutions, and events like today. Um, in addition to the um, very kind personal introduction, it's probably helpful to explain that I also work um, part-time with an organization called the European Human Rights Advocacy Center, um, who specialize in assisting litigation from um, lawyers in Russia, Georgia, and, and other countries in, in that region uh, to Strasbourg and the European Court of Human Rights. So my background in terms of European um, court experience started obviously uh, as a UK lawyer and the impact of Strasbourg jurisdiction upon my practice in the UK and also as a citizen in the UK. Uh, I then became involved um, with pro bono work assisting in cases being taken from other countries, primarily Turkey, um, and then in latter years have been working, as I say, with um, Iraq in these cases that um, then link to um, Russia, which is why, why I'm here today. And I've been asked to give really an overview of the court um, for uh, anyone who, who may not um, have any experience of it. I know and can see people with vast experience in the audience, so I apologize to anyone who knows it all already. But hopefully this will help to situate things in context for, for anybody who doesn't. And also I hope to try and paint perhaps a broader contextual picture of how um, the issues that relate to Russia aren't always isolated to Russia. So some of the problems you hear um, I in relation to perhaps um, influential uh, Russian figures speaking out against the court and the court's judgments uh, is not something that isn't replicated in other countries because regularly in the UK we have a debate and complaints in relation to the imposition of judgments um, upon our, uh, our system and our, uh, that interference with state sovereignty uh, as people often infer that to be. And so it's a, it's a wider contextual um, problem in that sense uh, and perhaps there are lessons that can be learned across the board uh, as a result of that. Um, so starting really very broadly, uh, I think in some ways the, the history of the European Court and the, and the Convention um, over the last 50 years in some ways could be said to paint a picture of Europe itself uh, over those years. If you think back to when it started and how it started, it was really a, a very idealistic um, I institution and um, very uh, ambitious goals at that time to have uh, a court which would have binding jurisdiction over um, state parties uh, within the region and allow individuals to bring applications to that court for violations against their own state was quite revolutionary, really. A and the fact that, that that has been achieved um, in some ways has led to the problems that you've already heard referred to, the numbers of cases, the overstretching of the court, the lack of resources. When the court started, um, only 10 state parties were signed up, and they were obviously Western democracies, effectively, who to the large to a large extent observe the rule of law that's a very different situation from what we're dealing with in the present day with 47 um, state parties signed up um, each with their own judge on the court to represent them um, but more importantly um, a number of systems which joined obviously after the collapse of the Soviet Union which come from from a hugely different standpoint in terms of human rights and some of the issues which the, the court is called to, to deal with. The, the diversity of issues which the court actually looks at um, and has looked at and, and ruled upon over the years it is quite astounding, and it, and it can be lost, particularly 
if you spend most of your time looking at um, Russian cases um, where the, the it can sometimes look a little bleak um, when you're looking at the overall picture. But, but if you look right from the start of the European Convention and the, and the court's findings and also look how the court has really played a phenomenal role in, in trying to centralise probably isn't quite the right word, but deal with um, very different jurisdictions, very different cultural backgrounds. So if you take as a very basic example the fact that, that the UK is a common law jurisdiction and most of the rest of Europe is a civil law jurisdiction, then the court was called upon in the 1990s to deal with the question of the restriction of the right to silence in criminal trials. That's something probably for any American, well certainly for any American lawyer, and I imagine for most uh, Americans full stop, that the thought that the, the right to silence within a criminal trial could be restricted in any way would be quite astonishing. But it has been restricted in the UK, and that's something which has been upheld in Strasbourg. And it's perhaps one of the ways you can see that, that human rights um, really transcends, and certainly in the European context, has come to kind of amalgamate the, the very basic and fundamental principles which um, uh, stretch across the board in, in the countries which the court is having to look at. Again, if you compare the cases that are most well known, perhaps from Russia, the, the, the bombing of the humanitarian corridor in the Chechen wars, the um, disappearances which are still continuing, the, the cases which relate to right to life, torture, the, the really the most fundamental rights. And remember that the court is not only dealing with those cases of the highest priority, but also then being asked to consider cases, for instance, of whether um, transsexuals should be allowed to change their birth certificates. Um, it's or, uh, again, in other recent cases, whether DNA could be retained when a person has been acquitted. These are, these are really quite nuanced and fine and complicated, sophisticated issues which the court is having to deal with in terms of the very real cutting edge of how human rights is developing within the broader European context, while at the same time ensuring or trying to ensure that sufficient resources are given to those individuals from countries where even the right to life is not yet sufficiently protected I in any form of meaningful way. And it, it's, it's helpful perhaps to remember that in the overall context when we're dealing with some of the issues and problems of the court, quite, quite how broad the arena is and the difficulties in uh, 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 bringing all together all those states and all those different questions. So I think I've already said that the, uh, th this was obviously an idealistic project at the start. The, the European Convention that's already been referred to um, really flowed from the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And you know, if anyone wanted to compare the documents, they're certainly not the same, but it's very clear to see the trajectory which is moving forward. The other very interesting thing about the European Convention is that it's, uh, it's what's referred to as a living instrument, and that, that's made very plain. Um, within the jurisdiction of the court. And it's, it, it is clear to see when you look at some of the jurisdictions over the years how things have developed, obviously from a very different position from the 1950s in European states. Uh, one example being that the death sentence was still used in uh, certainly in the UK and, and probably other states at that time. Since the 1950s and over the years, the developments are such that there's now even a, an additional protocol to the European Convention, which which means those who have signed up to it um, agree. Sorry, am I not loud enough? Uh, uh, agree that the death penalty will no longer be be used in those countries. Another example is if you look at the case histories of torture and ill treatment and the cases that have been dealt with before the court. Um, treatment which was previously defined as ill treatment rather than torture has been redefined in later years uh, as torture because of the changing definitions and because of the sense of a development of a society and a community which is supposed to be reflected by the convention and the, the case law of the court as it develops over the years. So in terms of the characteristics of the court, um, for anyone who's coming really to fresh and, and wondering why it, it's important and, and how it would set itself apart, as I've said already, it really the one of the primary facts is the right of individual application to the court. So in theory and in fact in practice, 
any individual who feels their rights have been violated by their state can go to the court and say, this is my complaint, um, this is why I feel my rights have been violated, please can you look, look at my case and obviously I, I seek justice I in relation to it. There is no need for a lawyer at that stage. Um, there may well become a need for a lawyer at a later stage, but, but at, at the outset that's not something which the, the court requires, which again is quite a, a remarkable um, starting point and certainly was in the 1950s. It was really a sense of open access for any citizen who wanted to and felt that they were aggrieved against their, against their state. Again, remarkable in terms of state sovereignty and if you read way back into the European <coughs> court history, th there's mention of the fact that initially um, courts, uh, uh, countries not only were signing up for uh, short periods in terms of um, allowing individual applications to the, the commission as it then was, but there was always this threat, this implied threat of potential withdrawal um, of that facility um, in the same way that we still have now with the sense that potentially if a, a state doesn't like um, what the court does or any case judgments, then there's always that threat and that possibility of withdrawal. That, of course, hasn't really happened. And it's particularly remarkable, I think, it hasn't happened in relation to Russia. And there are people here with far more ex expertise than me who might be able to shed light on, on why that is the case. But, it, but it's, it's quite a remarkable situation to have judgment after judgment against a state and no... Um, and no withdrawal, perhaps in the way that you see at the or have seen over the years at the International Court of Justice, when states don't like what's happening and don't like the results. Um, as well as the right of individual petition, there is um, the possibility of, and there are cases where um, states take cases against one another. Th that's used far less readily, perhaps for obvious reasons. Um, the idea, uh, again, was, was part of the idealistic nature of the setup of the court at the outset, which was that states would be able to police each other and their mon the, the, the rights that they were observing or not protecting within their own states. Um, in practical terms, there have been a limited number of those cases. One of the earliest ones was Ireland and the UK, which related to the treatment of IRA suspects um, in the 1970s when when obviously the, the court and the UK was dealing with how to grapple with terrorist suspects at that time. Um, th there's been a case in relation to Cyprus and Turkey and also cases in relation to Russia and Georgia. The point I'd make about the Cyprus and Turkey and Russia and Georgia I I is that which really indicates perhaps why interstate cases aren't being used so much in that the it's almost now viewed, it seems, as a as an almost an act of hostility. That's perhaps putting a little too high, but it's certainly not something which states enjoy, relish, or, or, or go around looking to take um, cases against another jurisdiction um, for all the reason perhaps we know about. Um, that links in, I think, to the inevitable political element of a, any international court, really. But in terms of the, the, the European court, it's perhaps demonstrated in, um, perhaps if you look at the Turkish cases, you can see, um, again, Turkey, similarly to Russia, um, over very many years there was a very pr protracted and, and repetitive litigation in relation to the very grave violations which are occurring largely in southeast Turkey and often against the Kurdish minority that related to disappearances, extrajudicial killings, raising of villages to the ground. Um, and... What was very interesting about those cases, and it has been interesting in terms of the political angle, is that when Turkey has made its applications to join the EU, the case law of the court has been very important and has been able to be used by, by uh, activists and, and anyone else um, who's interested to say, well, hang on a minute, in, in terms, it may, it's one thing to sign up to the convention in the court and to allow these cases, but in terms of actually complying with the rights that are protected, you can see in these judgments what, what has been happening and what hasn't been happening. And is that really consistent with membership of the EU and the, and the level of protection of human rights, which we would expect and want? And so it's interesting in that sense. It's also interesting 
um, and I think someone else is probably talking about this at a later stage, but in terms of implementation of judgments, because as was already uh, explained um, th at the outset, there are rightly um, complaints and grievances about the fact that, yes, judgments come through, um, Russia in particular pays over generally all the money it's required to pay over, but very little um, else in terms of concrete terms can be seen perhaps um, in relation to a fresh investigation where uh, there would it would seem likely that if an investigation was conducted, it may be possible to have criminal proceedings and actually bring somebody, an individual, to justice and have some accountability. Um, or change in legislation, although that's happened in certain instances, widely it doesn't, it doesn't tend to happen. Again, in a recent case from Azerbaijan, um, where a ruling was actually a, a judgment made by the court has effectively been ignored um, by by that state. Uh, in, in basic terms, I, a journalist who had fallen out with the, the president and uh, and the regime has made clear that he's really not going to be released regardless of who says what in any court anywhere. Um, so in terms of implementation, the, the Committee of Ministers have certain powers which have recently been strengthened to allow them to take steps against um, this form of non-implementation. That, again, isn't really happening in, in perhaps the more aggressive and meaningful way which um, one would like it to um, when you look at the history of these cases and, and the evidence that's there to suggest a, a real failure, a flagrant failure to... Um, actually deal with the uh, the underlying fundamentals of the justice of the situation and again that links in really to the politics and the real politic of the of the wider context and states being reluctant to to make even implicit threats within such a body against other states uh, and the reluctance to use the powers which have even been put there to to try and give a little bit more bite to the judgments of the court but there are developments in that region and it may be something which perhaps we can look at more with more satisfaction in, in the next couple of years, but we'll, we'll have to see on that front. Um, in terms of the protection that's granted, I'm, I'm not going to even try, and I've just realised I'm actually at the end of my 20 minutes, so I'll uh, try and do a few short sentences on the topics which remain. But I'm, uh, I wasn't even anyway going to go through the, the various rights, but, the, but they'll, most of them will be ones that you're all familiar with uh, and reflected in the, in the large majority of of human rights instruments. And what's interesting uh, in terms of, again, reasonably recent developments is, the, is that states are guaranteeing um, primarily those rights to people within their jurisdiction, which usually is defined on a territorial basis in terms of their own country. Um, that's something which is not always the case and has been um, effectively extended in certain instances particularly where you can show that uh, one country has effective control of the territory of the other. Um, it's a something which is being challenged further and, and being tried to be pushed further in terms of the South Ossetian cases um, from the conflict between Georgia and Russia and the violations which occurred when Russia had was either in occupation or in quasi-occupation of territory within Georgia. Uh, and again, you can you'll be able to see when those cases come out how the potential of the court, the convention as a living instrument and the principle that, that there should be no real vacuum of protection within the, um, the state's party signed up to the territory uh, of the convention it is such that the court will have to deal with that in, in a very careful way. Um, very quickly, uh, domestic remedies must be exhausted um, in the relevant country before an individual can go to the um, European Court of Human Rights. That effectively means going to the highest court or highest remedy that's available to you in your own country. A and if you're still not successful uh, at that level, you can then go to the European Court of Human Rights, but need to do so effectively within six months of um, the exhaustion at domestic level. I'm just gonna scoot through and see if there's anything really vital that needs to be fitted in. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> one more. If there is, presumably someone will ask. Really, one more <laughs> basic fact, and it's so basic that we maybe all in the audience assume this. I didn't realize this until a year ago, 
as I was learning about the European Court, and that is the European Court can literally trump or reverse, overcome, overrule the uh, decisions of the highest domestic court. Um, and that's something that the signatories um, to the convention agree to, um, essentially uh, uh, giving up, uh, as Joanna says, the sovereignty, the national sovereignty uh, in a judicial context. However, and that's right, uh, and then that is what they agree to, and that is what hap should happen in principle, but doesn't, doesn't always. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, a good example is, and I'm sorry to keep using UK cases, but they just happen to work a lot of the time. Th there's, a, there's a big controversy currently about whether prisoners should be allowed to vote in the UK. Um, there is the judgment is clear from Strasbourg, but nothing has been done for an extended period to the extent that there's even been a second judgment. So, uh, and you've even had the Prime Minister, in fact, coming into the public arena saying that he's disgusted at the prospect of prisoners being able to vote. So again, you can see the crossover between the political and the court and the, the, the principle and the reality of, of what happens. But that is right, that, 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 that certainly is the case, and that's what should happen. And uh, I know, again, within a, an American context, that's unusual and probably quite shocking. Right. <laughs> um, thanks, Joanna. Um, now we're going to hear from uh, Will Pomerantz. Uh, Will is the deputy director of the uh, Kennan Institute. Uh, he also teaches uh, Russian law at uh, Georgetown University, just across town here. Uh, before he came to Kennan uh, a little over, well, 11 years ago, um, he was a uh, program officer at the National Endowment for Democracy and uh, focused on Russia, uh, the Ukraine, and Belarus. Um, my parents thought I had a lot of degrees and was in school a long time, but Will trumps <laughs> almost everybody I know uh, who has, you know, not just a bachelor, not just a master's. Uh, not just a PhD, but also uh, a JD, a Juris Doctor. Um, and so I'm, I'm very pl proud and pleased to be up here at the at table with a, a scholar mm -hmm. who is uh, a real expert in um, this issue of, of human rights and the European Court. So, Will. Well, jo John, I'm grateful that you managed to, uh, I, I've actually only been at the Kennedy Institute for four years. Oh. It, was, it was the eight years that I practiced law that you skipped over, which, which I often like to skip over myself. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm very pleased. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I know that some of you might have, uh, when looking at the original program, noticed that Jeffrey Kahn was supposed to be here. Um, unfortunately, because of a family illness, he wasn't able to make it, so I'm going to pitch, pinch hit for him. Um, the goal of this presentation is to take what we've taken from, to take what we've heard from Joanna and transfer it to the Russian Federation uh, to explain how Russia came to be a member of the European Court and the Council of Europe and the productive and at times contentious relationship that has emerged ov over the past 13 years. Uh, this is a full day conference, so I will leave the nitty gritty of all the cases uh, to the next panel. So. Uh, We'll, we'll kind of get to the uh, caseload enforcement uh, after lunch. But as, uh, as was mentioned, Russia joined the convention uh, on February 28, 1996, and upon its ratification in May 1998, Russia became a full member of the Council of Europe. Now, there are lots of arguments pro and con in allowing Russia to join at that time. Uh, Russia actually wanted to join for a variety of reasons, uh, to gain acceptance as a democracy, since it was a very young democracy in the mid-1990s. Uh, it wanted to have the prestige of being a member of the Council of Europe, and I think it wanted to, uh, to improve trade relations and thought that uh, membership in the Council of Europe would facilitate that as well. Um, from the Council of Europe's perspective, it was a little bit less clear as to whether Russia should be allowed to join. Uh, to begin with, there were certain kind of strategic advantages for Russia becoming a member of the Council of Europe. Uh, it required that Russia provide certain assurances about its judicial system uh, that would allow for certain basic liberties, such as freedom of movement. Uh, it would change some of its judicial procedures, uh, most notably dealing with pretrial detention. Russia also agreed to harmonize certain laws with Council standards, uh, the law on the proxy or the prosecutor. Uh, the it promised to introduce new pr procedural codes, most notably the criminal procedure code, but also a new criminal code as well. 
and other membership criteria further required Russia to ratify various other legal treaties, such as the European Convention for the Prevention of Torture and the Framework Convention for the Protection of Mi Minorities. Uh, the, media, the immediate problem for the Council of Europe and for Russia was that in terms of institutions, uh, laws, and legal tradition, uh, Russia really did not meet the standards of the Council of Europe upon its application. Uh, it had no real tradition of an independent judiciary. The Constitutional Court, which is the primary interpreter of human rights, uh, had been dis suspended, in, suspended in 1993 and only reinstated in 1995 and actually had a very limited history in terms of actual providing jurisprudence on these types of, of human rights issues. And of course, many, much of the legislation that was still in force in the mid-1990s was still Soviet legislation. Uh, some of it had been revised, some of it had been updated, some of it had been supplemented by presidential decrees, but, the, but this, it was still essentially a Soviet system which lacked basic elements of due process. So I think there was a legitimate debate at the time of Russia's accession to the Council of Europe. But in the end, this, the decision was made by the Council uh, that integration, quote, integration is better than isolation and that cooperation is better than confrontation. <laughs> and so Russia became a member of the Council in Europe and thereby became subject to the European Convention and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. So to what extent have the expectations of these debates in the 1990s been met? Uh, in other words, has membership in the Council of Europe and the European Court bent Russia more towards Europe and European standards of human rights? Or alternatively, has Europe been forced to change its standards and make concessions to include Russia? And that's the fundamental question that I want to address during the rest of my talk. Now, on the positive side, uh, the court de facto has become a por an important part of the judicial process. And as we've already heard, uh, we've already, uh, Russia has a significant number of pending cases before the European Court. Uh, in 2010, it was almost 42,000 pending cases, which represented 28% of the total caseload. Uh, the types of disputes are varied, but the largest number of cases revolve around the non-execution of court decisions by Russian authorities. Uh, other disputes include unlawful detentions, violati violations of freedom of speech or assembly. Uh, significant, uh, significant penalties have been imposed on Russia by the court um, as a result of these cases. Some of these cases, the penalties may be perceived as relatively small, between 3,000 and 4,000 euros, but for your average Russian, that's still a substantial penalty. And over the last few years, fines in excess of 100,000 euros have occurred. Uh, some of these cases have political consequences and are quite contentious. Uh, Mr. Hodakovsky and the uh, sh shareholders of Mucos have uh, cases pending before the European Court, and they've been pending, I think, since about 2004, uh, with no apparent decision as of yet in most of these uh, cases. Um, as we'll learn more in the second panel from Tanya Lokshina, there have been a huge number of uh, Chechen cases. Uh, the European Court also recently found that Russia's law on political parties was excessively draconian, in particular criticizing the membership requirements, which are the highest in Europe. Europe. And I was looking at uh, my commerce on today, and I learned that uh, the European Court has just uh, imposed a penalty against Russia involving the, s the case of the scientist uh, Igor Sutiag Sutiagin, uh, and has ordered Russia, who was a, he's a, a prominent scientist who was charged with espionage, and the European Court has just demanded that Russia pay a 20,000 euro fine towards to him. Um, despite the growing influence of the court, I think it must be emphasized that the European Court itself is no substitute for Russian courts. They only handle a tiny number of cases relatively uh, in comparison to the total number of cases that are heard in Russia. Uh, it takes a long time to lit litigate these cases, as uh, the Hordakovsky cases have shown. And in many instances, um, petitioners really require legal assistance from Russian lawyers um, in order to pursue this litigation. Most Russians, at least initially, don't, did not know about the, the European option and required assistance before pursuing litigation in Strasbourg. Uh, so 
although I don't think one should over exaggerate the impact of the European Court, uh, it still has nevertheless had a significant impact on the practice of law in present day Russia. I think as several of the practitioners in this room will be, would be able to tell you, it's now common practice for lawyers to pursue a dual strategy in pursuing human rights litigation through the Russian courts and then when the option becomes available to the European court. And in any controversial dispute, uh, the cry immediately goes out that uh, we intend to go to Strasbourg. So in terms of the level of activity, I think the original decision to include Russia into the European court has largely been vindicated. Um, as John implied and as Joanna mentioned as well, the court has become a major conduit by which international law flows into the Russian judicial system. Now international law is assigned a rather large role under the Russian constitution. Article 15.4 of the Russian constitution states that the generally recognized principles and norms of international law and of the inter and international treaties of the Russian Federation constitute an integral part of the legal system. Article 17 of the Russian Constitution adds that the rights and freedoms of the individual and citizen shall be recognized and guaranteed under the universally acknowledged norms and principles of international law and in accordance with the Russian Constitution. Now, obviously, under th this provision, the Convention on Human Rights itself is recognized and becomes a part of Russian law. Moreover, um, as the Constitutional Court and its Chairman Valery Zorkin have emphasized, European court decisions also are binding on Russian courts as long as they express generally recognized norms and principles of international law. And as a result, um, European court decisions in, in fact have become a part of a broader phenomenon in Russian law today and that is they've become to be viewed as, to a certain degree, as precedent. Now, as Joanna mentioned, Russia is a civil law country and really doesn't recognize the notion of precedent, uh, that a case, decided case formulates, formulates a basis for determining later cases involving similar facts and issues. Yet despite kind of the conventional view of the Russian legal system, uh, precedent has crept in from a variety of sources, uh, from the constitutional court and indeed from the regular courts who occasionally cite um, previous decisions as part of judicial practice. So the European court, in this sense, is part of a broader trend in Russia, dealing, uh, supporting the de facto recognition of the role of precedent and judicial decision making, um, thereby, I think, enhancing the status of the Russian judiciary. So on one level, the European court decisions support the notion, the emerging notion of precedent or support the principle of judicial decision making in Russia. Moreover, it becomes an important vehicle by which international law enters Russian law. So that when you pick up a constitutional court decision nowadays, you'll often find references to the convention, but also to previous cases that have been decided by the European court, uh, providing a dis additional explanation or justification as to why the court is ruling in a particular area. The difficulty that remains, and Anton Burkhoff will talk about this in more detail in the second panel, is that uh, despite the, the flow of, of law into, these di into Russian law from the European court, it's really limited to uh, the constitutional court and the Supreme Court. It's the, the, the reach of the convention and European court's decisions on a regional level are much more limited. Uh, when a lawyer appears before a regional court, they really don't want to hear about the practices in Strasbourg. They want the issue to be addressed <coughs> in terms of how Russian law applies. Thus, I think while international law and the European court decisions have penetrated elite institutions, they really haven't filtered down into the regional courts in a systematic fashion. Uh, the final influence that I want to discuss of the European court and its influence on Russia today is on the appellate process. And I don't want to get too deep into Russian procedural law here because I don't think this is really a, a procedural crowd. But um, and nevertheless, I do want to kind of explain how the European court has influenced the appellate process in Russia because I think that influence has been profound. Uh, Russia doesn't actually have one single Supreme Court like the United States has, but three specialized courts, each with their own Supreme Court, as it were. Uh, the courts of uh, general jurisprudence, which hear the vast majority of civil and criminal cases, which is headed by the Supreme Court. 
the arbitrage or commercial courts that hear disputes among um, enterprises and headed by the Supreme Arbitrage Court, and finally the constitutional court, which hears disputes through a variety of mechanisms, uh, requests from other courts, but also from the legislature, uh, organs of executive power, and individual citizens. All these courts are now subject to the rights expounded upon in the European Convention and the appellate jurisdiction of the European Court. Now, as Joanna mentioned, there is this idea of exhaustion of domestic remedies, that no one can appeal to the European Court until you've gone through the entire legal system. And in theory, that's how it should work in Russia. But for a variety of reasons, that is not the case. Again, I'm not going to dwell too much on the, the particularities of Russian procedure, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the R Russian Federation retained its system of nadzor, or supervisory review, which is a particularly Soviet institution that allowed the procracy to reopen a case long after a final judgment had been entered. Uh, the procracy didn't even have to consult with the individual parties at hand in order to try to reopen the case. So essentially that meant that really no decision in the Soviet system was, was truly final, and that there was always the risk that these cases could be, re could be reopened um, via supervisory review. Now when the European Court first addressed this issue, and it was via a Romanian appeal and then a Ukrainian appeal, it found the system of supervisory review to be in violation of the, of the convention and the former Eastern Bloc countries gradually got rid of the system of supervisory review. Um, when the European Court first addressed the Russian version of supervisory review, it also arrived at a similar, but not quite so sweeping, criticism of the process. Yet, rather than abandon the idea of supervisory review, Russia's retained the system, although it's transformed it significantly by decreasing deadlines and opening up the process to all parties. Nevertheless, that hasn't satisfied the European Court. And what the European Court decided is that a final judgment in the Russian circumstances was not the decision by the Supreme Court, but a final judgment that is subject to appeal to Strasbourg occurs after the first cassation or appeal decision and does not necessarily require that a petitioner exhaust all avenues of appeal or all avenues within the supervisory review process before appealing to Strasbourg. So when you look at the huge numbers of cases before the European Court, uh, one of the reasons for this is because they don't actually have to exhaust all the domestic remedies uh, that exist in Russia, that you can actually appeal a decision uh, before it has gone to the High Court. Um, I think this really be shows the influence of the European Court. Russia has tried to change its system, although not abolish it, but nevertheless, the European Court has inserted, inserted itself in the process of reviewing these cases at a much earlier uh, stage than in other European countries. So to summarize, I think Russia has had to venture Europe in a variety of very important ways. Uh, it has the European Court has become a part of an alternative appellate process located outside the Russian Federation, but nevertheless must be enforced by the Russian state. It has led to the direct flow of international law into the Russian judicial system. It has resulted in judgments against the Russian state and the imposition of significant fines. It has led to major revisions in Russian legislation and led to major, major changes in the appellate process. So I think you can really begin to see how much influence the European Court has had on Russia, not only in terms of the judgments, but in really beginning to try to change the Russian judicial system as a whole, most notably in forcing Russia to try to introduce reforms in its appellate process. Now, as Joanna mentioned, this has resulted in a variety of different complaints and <coughs> criticisms from the Russian Federation, uh, that the complaints that the court is interfering in Russia's sovereignty, and the Minister of Justice has also questioned the impartiality and the objectivity of the court. And finally, Russia has not addressed the underlying conditions that have led to the flood of cases into, into the European, to the European Court in the first place. And I think this ambivalent response from the Russian Federation uh, raises the question that, uh, that, was this, that, was that I talked about at the beginning of my talk, namely to what extent has Europe diluted its standards to keep Russia within the, the Council of Europe? Or to put another way, 
are the fines that are paid by Russia, uh, which are significant, but are they really kind of pocket change to the Russian Federation in comparison to the prestige that Russia continues to enjoy by being a member of the European Court? Uh, we'll return to this question, I think, in panel three this afternoon when we address the broader policy questions associated with the court, both for the Russian Federation and in for the United States. What is interesting to note is that Russia recently had a clear choice as to whether it wanted to remain in the European Court or to leave it. And this revolved around the question of the ratification of so-called Protocol 14, a reform that essentially expedites the handling of applications before the court. After a long and very contentious delay, uh, Russia finally chose to ratify the Protocol 14 in February 2010, and thus, I think, made a conscious decision to remain inside uh, the Council of Europe as opposed to potentially drifting outside of it. Uh, the European Court recently has also put more teeth in its decision-making process, uh, most notably by issuing a so-called pilot judgment against Russia that specifically called on Russia to address the problem of the non-execution of decisions. Therefore, in many ways, I think we're entering a new stage in the relationship between Russia and the European Court, and in a country with, at best, a, a faltering legal system, I think there's a chance that the court may exert even greater influence than it has in the past going forward. Thanks, Will. Um, <clears throat> our final panelist is uh, Natasha Tabina. Um, she has almost 20 years of work in the field of human rights. And since 2004, uh, she's been the director of the Public Verdict Foundation. Um, Natasha is an expert on international human rights standards and mechanisms and human rights issues in connection with law enforcement bodies and NGO management and evaluation. And so we're very anxious to hear her perspective on the European Court and its influence in, in Russia. Natasha. Thank you very much, and I would like to first uh, to start with uh, uh, saying thanks uh, for the invitation uh, to Jackson Foundation and to Kennan Institute to be here. It's a great privilege, uh, and uh, I've been asked uh, to uh, talk about the NGO experience in terms of European Court of Human Rights, and I would like to focus uh, mostly not only the process of uh, filing complaints where the Russian NGOs quite experienced and achieved a lot of results, but uh, mostly on uh, uh, Russian NGOs' experience in the process of uh, implementation judgments. And uh, uh, in general, uh, NGOs have no formal place in the process of implementation simply because uh, NGOs is a not, are not a subject of implementation. On the international, intergovernmental level, uh, international NGOs are engaged in the designing such a role and the approval of uh, legitimacy of a participation of NGOs in the implementation of a, uh, European court judgments. In particular, in uh, uh, last recent, uh, l last uh, two years, a number of international NGOs have entered into the European conversation about what should be European Court after the reform which is going on now in the European Court. Uh, their submissions, in particular, emphasize the importance of NGOs as a members of an informal network that leads to create uh, a more favor favorable environment for the activities of the European Court, as well as uh, importance uh, the contribution of NGOs as a sources of information and analysis about the quality of implementation of uh, European Court judgments at the national level. Uh, specialists from the Russian NGO sector began to use uh, the European Convention instruments from the very beginning of the uh, European court activity in Russia. Some NGOs, like the International, uh, like the Center of for International Protection, which Karina Moskalenko represents here, started to learn these instruments even before Russia became a member of the Council of Europe. It obviously gives a uh, handicap for NGOs which allows to beat the capacity in terms of diverse expertise related to the European Court and the implementation of its judgments. 
potential place of NGOs in promoting the implementation of the European Court judgments in terms of mainly in terms of uh, general measures is related primarily to the existing national level characteristics and problems with implementation process. Uh, our organization conducted last year uh, the study on the role and place of uh, NGOs in the implementation of judgments uh, of the European Court in terms of general measures. And uh, I would like here to present most significant results of this study. Uh, from the beginning, it's important to emphasize that the promotion of implementation of the European Court judgments regarding to general measures uh, have not yet been a common focus of activity for several dozens of Russian NGOs which work is somehow related to the European Court of Human Rights. At the same time, it's important uh, to note that the situation is changing rapidly and more and more NGOs realize the importance of efforts uh, concerning the implementation and include such work in the scope of their activity. Uh, to our opinion, the functions of NGOs in the process of implementation can be roughly, roughly uh, summarized uh, in uh, four categories. Uh, the informational work, uh, the educational and awareness raising work, uh, the expert and analytical and strategic work, and the fourth category is uh, lobbying and advocacy. Uh, during our study, we have collected about dozen of different practices uh, which Russian NGOs uh, use as a part of a contribution to the implementation process. And uh, um, I, 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 I would like to talk about, uh, be, uh, talk a little bit about uh, these uh, practices and uh, also summarize them in these uh, four formats which I mentioned before. Within the uh, informational category of the uh, work of the Russian NGOs uh, in terms of uh, uh, implementation process, we found uh, two main practices and uh, they are quite obvious uh, ones. Uh, the first practice is a dissemination of information about the European Court uh, judgments in the professional environment among judges, lawyers, prosecutors, relevant uh, authorities, judiciary, officials of uh, relevant uh, government agencies. And there are a number of examples uh, uh, we were NGOs quite active in this area, like uh, legal initiative in Moscow. They do regular post notification of uh, parties uh, who are involved in uh, uh, in the cases uh, which has been considered by the court. Sutyazhnik in Yekaterinburg informing the courts, uh, regional judges on particular group of cases so that we will be able to take into account the information when we're taking a decision uh, in the at the national level. The second practice is um, connected to update and comment on judgments to the for the public purposes. And here is uh, the organization in Komi uh, Republic is quite active. Uh, they do a lot uh, a lot of work concerning dissemination of information about judgments. Uh, outreach from mass media and internet, actualization of ideas about the particular judgments and its desired effects. Uh, uh, just uh, one example is an uh, informational campaign organized by these NGOs uh, uh, around a uh, number of cases uh, uh, where uh, in respect of the residents of these regions. Uh, the second block uh, of the activities is uh, educational activities and uh, we found here two main practices is a, the first one is a teaching on European convention and uh, European court judgments uh, uh, for authorities uh, in the uh, in the system of measures to improve their professional skills like uh, schools to improve their professional skills uh, for judges, uh, for law enforcement officers, and uh, other uh, categories of uh, public of uh, state officials. And uh, here uh, there are uh, 
number of organizations who are quite active in this area. For example, uh, uh, Nizhny Novgorod Committee Against Torture has a training school for judges. Men and Law and Joe in the Republic Ma Mariel has a uh, training school for policemen. Uh, the Center for International Protection has a school for lawyers. Uh, uh, our organizations provide training for investigators uh, of ins investigative committee and number and some other uh, NGOs do similar work. The second practice is uh, creating and uh, disseminating of uh, methodological literature and thematic surveys aimed at uh, increasing competence in the legal community and the amount relevant bodies on specific issues, cases, group of cases, and violations. And again, number of Russian NGOs quite active in this area and uh, develop a lot of literature editions uh, concerning uh, European Convention, uh, European Court judgments, uh, uh, do surveys on uh, particular topics in terms of uh, uh, particular topic, but particular thematic topics uh, on judgments, uh, and uh, uh, mostly all mentioned, bef all organizations which I've already mentioned uh, do such work. In the uh, third category of uh, format uh, which uh, NGOs uh, use uh, uh, and uh, contribute in the implementation process is uh, expert and analytical fa formats. Uh, and uh, we found here even more practices, four practices. Uh, the first one is a uh, expert commentary, analysis and recommendations on particular judgments uh, of the European Court in terms of general measures, proposing measures uh, to achieve a new standard to realization of uh, rights or freedoms. The second practice, uh, an independent evaluation of the implementation process on the concrete judgments or the group of judgments uh, in terms of general measures, development or adaptation of standards on a national level. Uh, the Third practice is uh, the developing approaches and models on strategic cases uh, and carrying out strategic litigation. And the fourth uh, practice is the participation of NGOs as a third party in the cases in order to achieve the fullest possible court decision. And also actions associated uh, in the introduction of European court judgments uh, in the national legal practice through NGO participation in the national court, in the national trials. trials. And uh, the fourth format of activity, which is uh, lobbying and advocacy, and we found here uh, three uh, practices. The first one is uh, lobbying for changes in the federal legislation that uh, would uh, simplify the implementation and changes uh, in the administrative practice with the ju judicial system and law enforcement practices. The second practice uh, is uh, interaction with the public authorities uh, to promote the activities uh, on implementation uh, of the European Court judgments. And the third practice is uh, promoting uh, of ideas and advocacy activities at the level of work with the staff of a representative of Russian Federation in the European Court and uh, with the Secretariat of the Committee of Ministers. Uh, so you see that uh, there are a number of different uh, practices which uh, Russian NGOs have already used uh, in order to contribute to the implementation process. But despite the fact that such formats are quite diverse and uh, there are many of them, it's uh, important to note that in general, promoting implementation of uh, judgments in terms of general measures does not happen so far as a uh, thoughtful and um, well-planned process in the NGO community. Uh, through our study of uh, internet data and uh, expert interviews, uh, we could not find an example of uh, a comprehensive approach uh, to implementation. 
In this area, we see a lot of opportunities and uh, further steps uh, that could and should be done by Russian NGOs. And uh, most important of uh, them, from our point of view, are the following. We think that uh, now is the time to switch from the um, primary task as a filling complaint to the primary task uh, to the implementation. Because uh, dozens of NGOs that are working on filling complaints uh, um, uh, with the uh, filling complaints to the European Court uh, are now operates in Russia and study of uh, their experience and assessments by experts uh, show that this work continue to be perceived as a whole, as a primarily for these NGOs. And uh, we think that in terms of public interests, uh, it's uh, rather essential that the process of contributing to the implementation is perceived by at least some of the, these NGOs as a primarily uh, rather than secondary in importance. It means uh, that even at the initial stage of working with uh, some particular case, there is a need for planning and modeling activities that are strategically, strategic, sorry, strategic, strategic strategically, strategically, thank you very much, strategically <laughs> focused on implementation. And in these terms, court, judgments is just the intermediate stage in this strategy. And uh, we see here uh, two possible approaches. Focus on implementation in the form of strategic lit litigation and focus on using an existing scope of uh, court judgments. But at the same time, even with switching to the implementation, uh, primary task. The value of individual cases as individual examples of uh, restoration of the rights should not be underestimated. Uh, there may be a strategy designed to work on judgments on uh, so-called clone cases uh, where achievements of judgments and implementation happen due to receiving um, kind of critical uh, mass of judgments when the factor of their multiplicity at some point is provoking the changes. Uh, we also see that at present there is a lack of uh, existing uh, level of communications uh, between NGOs within uh, the Russian uh, uh, Federation and there is a need uh, for revival of communication among lawyers and professionals involved in the work with the European Court uh, uh, instruments especially now when the reform of the European Court is going on. And uh, we see the important role of NGOs in the formation of uh, favorable public background and uh, interdisciplinary approach to the implementation. Um, it seems that uh, the general approach of NGOs in the field of implementation should be informational proactive, focusing on uh, multiplication of information and knowledge in the judicial system and the in the society in general, as well as on the uh, availability of the relevant documents. NGO can play in this process one of the most important roles increasing their credibility, their credibility as an institution which is meaningful for implementation process. In addition, since the work uh, on implementation does not belong to the pure legal expertise, there is obvious elements of PR, GR, etc. Uh, the general approach here could be the interaction of different actors, finding the intersectional points of interest of different stakeholders. For example, NGOs and uh, professional lawyers, barristers, uh, uh, especially since uh, the number of uh, uh, barristers uh, have their own experience uh, with the European Court. And uh, uh, last uh, thing, uh, last uh, uh, 
approach which could be used uh, by the NGOs uh, to improve their participation, uh, quality of their, of their participation in the implementation process uh, could be the uh, strategic litigation with the participation of international NGOs. Uh, it seems promising not only um, the idea of a coalition of Russian NGOs, but also cooperation with the international NGOs. Especially useful, it uh, can be in terms of strategic litigation on the cases, group of cases, topic related to implementation. In the same role, uh, there is the task uh, to promote interaction in the context of discussion uh, on uh, the court reform. Until now, international NGOs uh, have played in their process leading role. Uh, however, it seems uh, reasonable to include and strengthen the presence of Russian NGOs in this process. And uh, um, concluding, I would like to emphasize once again that Russian NGOs have already made a lot of to introduce in the European Court instruments and the European, uh, in European, the European Convention instruments and the European Court standards uh, into the Russian national practice, played the significant role in forming an array of Russian cases. Uh, Russian NGOs become more and more active, creative, and strategic thinking in terms of implementation process. At the same time, there is still much what to do in improving Russian, uh, in improving Russian NGO role and uh, concrete activities in terms of implementation process. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Um, I'm, I have a question for each of the panelists, and then we're going to open it up uh, so there will be questions from the audience. Um, so starting with Joanna um, and the experience you relate from the United Kingdom and it's uh, ignoring the judgment of the European Court with respect to prisoners' rights to vote. Um, United Kingdom is a member state. Uh, they've signed the Council of Europe. Um, they, uh, when they sign that, they agree to abide by the judgment of the court. Um, and if they don't, you said it's referred to the Committee of Ministers at the Council of Europe. What's what happens there at the Committee of Ministers to, to remedy to remedy the um, obvious uh, 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 ignorance of the uh, or or lack of enforcement of the judgment of the court? What what can happen? <coughs> uh, what does happen actually is very little in honest terms. Um, but no, in 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 seriousness, there's uh, my understanding is that. The, the way most things happen are politically um, in terms of negotiations behind the scenes. So it's supposed to be an opportunity for representatives of member states to um, dialogue and put pressure on one another to um, comply. Uh, in, in terms of specific powers, there, are, there is an ability to refer back to the court. There, um, in, in extreme circumstances, there's an ability to suspend voting rights or to suspend memberships. Um, that just doesn't really happen effectively. Some things are happening, as I say, in relation to the Fatalayev case from Azerbaijan, um, which is a very extreme example, and very detailed questions have been asked. Um, I'm told because most of it I I is in private, um, and it is hoped that as a result of the the com various combinations of pressures that the action will follow. But but it, it really is a classic example of the the political realm overshadowing the judicial. Um, th and usually, and I think in the in the history of the CHR, it's really been a matter of state's goodwill in a sense as in so for the for the UK uh, essentially if you're signed up to something you uh, generally speaking <laughs> comply with it at present the the, the, the current um, I was going to say regime which is a little bit unfair but the current government um, hasn't really explained exactly how it justifies or um, is is planning to not comply with the judgment but in fairness the previous government uh, obviously the opposition party did nothing for several years as well. So it's been an ongoing problem, and it's one which isn't very popular with the public. 
um, the, the, the final way of dealing with it would be to withdraw from the ECHR, which um, the Cameron government has threatened to do on a number of occasions. Mm. The likelihood of that actually happening is very, very low and, it, and seems to be being used as a, a political tool. Thank you. Um, will uh, protocol... Exactly. Yeah, which is why it's so unlikely to happen. Big. Will Protocol 14, um, big deal in terms of Russia and the European Court. Um, what What do you see it now that it's been um, ratified by uh, by Russia? How is it going to change how the court operates? Well, <coughs> the the major goal of Protocol 14 is to expedite proceedings, so that, as I understand it, I'm not a particular expert on the procedure of this, but there will now be a one judge who will actually review the case and see whether it will actually proceed to a full hearing, as, as I understand it. Is and and once, once the one judge decides to proceed, whether or not the case proceeds or not, it would then go to a three-judge panel. So in terms of procedure, I the idea is to somehow deal with the c huge number of Russian cases. Um, that are flooding the courts so that they can expedite the process. I think one of the interesting things about Russia's ratification of Protocol 14 in a broader context, really, is, is how Russia works within these international institutions. Um, when you look at how Russia has signed certain documents but not ratified them, um, when you look at, for example, the Energy Charter, which it signed, it doesn't ratify in its first statement. Once it signs it, it's we want to change the rules uh, of how the Energy Charter actually works. It's very interesting to see uh, how Russia interacts with Protocol 14 and how that ultimately leaves uh, its, its, its participation within the organization. I think what is very interesting with Protocol 14 is really the, the, Europe, the, the Council of Europe did not bend towards Russia. And in fact, the, the Council of Europe basically decided that if Russia didn't ratify Protocol 14, it would find another way by which to introduce these measures um, so that other countries could deal with an expedited process and leave Russia behind. And when confronted with the possibility of being left behind or being perceived as an active member of the Council of Europe and the European Court, Russia chose to be an active member of the court and to ratify Protocol 14. So um, in terms of its overall participation, I think it was, um, I mean, Russia was basically two years behind everyone else in terms of actually ratifying Protocol 14. But I think by doing so, it has made a conscious choice, as I said, to remain within Europe and to remain a active participant. Thanks. Natasha, I'm interested in the, in the, the nitty-gritty as a lawyer. If I was uh, in uh, Russia and I wanted to enforce uh, a judgment of the European court, do I go back to the Russian court and ask that court to take action, or do I have to take some action against the government? How, how do you actually enforce it uh, in a, as a practical matter? How, do you, how does that happen in Russia? Actually, it happens uh, in different ways uh, and uh, in terms of uh, what legal work could be done. I think uh, during our second session, uh, the uh, panelist would talk about it uh, and uh, there is a possibility to go in the court and uh, demand uh, the uh, reopening the case uh, and uh, at the same time uh, there is a difficulties with this and uh, not a lot of positive, I would say, little positive experience. For example, we have more than 100 cases, uh, I think 150 cases uh, which already uh, results with the judgments uh, in the European Court, which so-called Chechen cases, uh, and in uh, almost all of them, uh, there is a need for effective investigation, but still there is no effective investigation, and all demands made by Russian angels, lawyers who are involved in such cases, uh, did not uh, um, reach uh, any solutions and did not uh, resulted in the proper investigation of such cases. But uh, if uh, not to talk as a 
legal, not, not to talk about the legal work, but about uh, other uh, activities which could be done by angels in terms of uh, uh, implementation. Uh, as I said, there are a number of different activities uh, on a local level, so which somehow uh, connected to the implementation process, not on this particular case, which went mm. through the judgments, but uh, mm. on uh, general situations, systematic problems, uh, which has been raised by this judgment and uh, existing in different uh, regions of Russian federations and Russian NGOs quite active uh, in trying to improve the situation and to use these judgments uh, as a tool to create, uh, to, to, to achieve some systematic changes on local levels. Uh, just on a positive note to follow on from that, w we actually have one case where um, Following the judgment is uh, and in action, um, it was taken back to court in in Chechnya, and the investigation has been reopened. So that's obviously a very far cry from the investigation being effective and having a um, a result. But and I also think that the I thought that the Russian Justice Initiative have have had similar um, success in in trying to reopen. Obviously, it will remain to be seen as yes, Sasha says yes. what actually happens. Yes. But I just wanted to give a, a slight <laughs> a slight ray of hope in there. Thanks, Joanna. Um, so, questions from the audience. Uh, we've got staff with microphones uh, back here. Uh, oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Rodin. I'm from Open Society Foundations. Um, I have two questions. Um, I think probably Natasha would be um, the best to answer them, although um, you guys might have some insight too, especially for the first. Um, I'm very curious about how uh, the European Court of Human Rights is taught in law schools and whether or not there's an opportunity for NGOs to get involved in informing legal professionals at the beginning of their career about the court. Um, so that's my first question. And my s second question is um, relates to um, disseminating information about the court to the Russian general public what strategies, Natasha, do you see that are most effective in really uh, informing the public on, um, on, on the availability of this court? Um, and I mean, I guess sort of more specifically, what do you see are the most effective strategies, more specific than just uh, mass media campaigns? Uh, continue your first question about the legal community and the possibility to teach them uh, uh, on uh, European Convention and uh, European Human Rights uh, Standards. Uh, in the high school, in the legal, um, how it's called, legal department, legal, le legal faculties uh, of the high schools, uh, uh, there is no special courses on the uh, European human rights instruments, the, and this is a problem. So s students so who are graduated from the legal faculty know almost nothing about uh, European Convention. At the very beginning of their career, uh, the uh, people who are started to work uh, as uh, lawyers uh, or as uh, investigators in the investigation commi investigative committee uh, have uh, quite limited knowledge on the European Convention and uh, the European Human Rights Standards. And uh, uh, I think uh, the only um, happening in terms of uh, this lack of knowledge uh, is what Russian NGOs do in this area. I mean, different courses in different uh, regions uh, which provide knowledge on European Convention and European Court and the European Human Rights Standards to um, uh, concrete groups of uh, either state authorities or lawyers or judges. Uh, and uh, it's definitely not enough because Russian NGOs are not able to cover all legal community and to provide knowledge to all legal community, but at least it's something which is going on and uh, uh, happening now. 
as for your second question concerning dissemination in of uh, information about court to the general public, I think that strategically uh, this activity is uh, quite important uh, from two points of views. First of all, uh, uh, Russian uh, public opinion is that the European Court is the last hope because of uh, very bad uh, judicial system uh, in, uh, in the Russia, because of uh, a lot of violation violations uh, committed by law enforcement agencies, etc. So Russian belief that all their problems have could be resolved in the Strasbourg. But at the same time, we don't know a lot how to apply, what are violations, what are regulations, and in and that's why there are a lot of applications submitted to the court which are uh, in inadmissible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And we believe that uh, uh, providing the information, dissemination the information on the uh, how European court works, uh, what are the uh, regulations, etc., could help to improve at least quality of such uh, applications or, or at least uh, to uh, decrease the number of application which is uh, uh, inadmissible. And uh, Sarah, after lunch, uh, Anton Burkhoff will have more to say about education of the, of the lawyers or the lack, the lack thereof. And I'm curious, Joanna, can you add to this? Uh, how, did, how did you learn? Why, how did you become a practitioner? Oh, um, well, we do it at law school, and then really, I just did it sort of thereafter. But I would like to add, actually, because I, I think it's important that I, I, I agree with what Natasha was saying earlier about the the emphasis on filings, perhaps to the, to the detriment of other other things. Because I mean, no, no one would ever disagree with um, public dissemination of information and educating people in, in important matters. But in terms of priorities, and certainly in, in terms of Funding, um, my understanding is, and certainly there are studies that w which suggest that, that the numbers of applications to the European Court relate to the faith which uh, citizenship have in, in their own judiciary. And I d there doesn't seem to be a problem in people going to Strasbourg at present from Russia, if I can put it frankly. That I mean, obviously it's a large country with a, l a, l a large uh, citizenship, but th there's not a shortage of people coming forward. The difficulty is in the structural mechanisms within the country itself and also people having uh, um, a faith that the once they go to Strasbourg that will be implemented in the in the systems itself. Um, linking back to so your your question, the first one in, in terms of education, um, there is, I think, very recently been set up a, a legal clinic type um, uh, project which uh, someone either still at Memorial or used to be at Memorial is is coordinating in, in Russia, um, which isn't something that we did in the UK particularly, but is now becoming more um, regular and obviously something that's used to great effect in this country. But but the, the, the fact that it's not taught, which I'm sorry, I didn't realize at all, wasn't taught at all, is is problematic because obviously that the whole point of the system is that you that each jurisdiction should be implementing within its own domestic law what the, what the rights and, and the guarantees mm -hmm. Ah, and and I had assumed that that happened as it does in most European countries. Mm. David Fishman, visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. This is a question probably for uh, Joanna Evans, although since it's on a topic that Will Pomerantz raised, Will, you might have a comment or thought on this as well. In the area of uh, disputes that involve um, commercial matters, at least tangentially, where uh, there's a claim of a businessman being uh, badly mistreated by a, uh, by a government authority or something of that nature. Joanna, what proportion of cases, not just in Russia, but more broadly, because the broader perspective would be helpful here, uh, potentially involve these matters? There are obviously some jurisdictional limitations on the part of the court. I mean, a contract dispute between two people con couldn't conceivably I wouldn't think, come before the court. But could you give some sort of an, an overview of, of where that issue comes up, um, 
and perhaps it also comes up on individual claims of sex discrimination and unequal pay or things of that nature. But Can I just try and clarify the question a bit? Uh, is it when you say ill treatment of businessmen, do you mean, for instance, somebody who's imprisoned as a result of standing up? Well, a, 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 tax, a, ta a tax issue where somebody is wrongly or uh, wrongly accused of a, of a tax violation and uh, hence okay. imprisoned for that or something okay. along those lines. Um, I, I, I simply can't tell you w what relates to businessmen as opposed to other individuals. It's, it's something I've never looked at. But uh, for that kind of situation, it would need to fit within one of the violations or one of the, the rights of the convention and, and, and it would sound probably that what you're complaining of if, it, if a wrongful conviction or a wrongful prosecution would come under article 6 and the right to a fair trial which are exceptionally difficult cases uh, I think personally to deal with because uh, as a bottom line what Strasbourg looks at is the the overall fairness of the proceedings um, and that can sometimes be very difficult to tell uh, as an outsider at a later stage. Obviously, if you have very flagrant violations where people aren't allowed to bring their witnesses or to speak or you know, they're gagged and bound in court, it's, it's slightly more easy to, to deal with it. But the, the, but the more nuanced abuses and, and corruptions that exist um, are, uh, are, more, are more tricky. Um, but I think that's probably where it would fall. But And in answer to your subsidiary question, a, a contractual matter um, would only ever come before the court if it related to the state and an obligation of individuals to the state. So two individuals between themselves would never be before that court unless there was some sort of state governmental involvement. Um, well, uh, the, uh, the only thing I add is that unfortunately Karina Maskalenko is not here. She's, she's here for the conference, but she's not, uh, she's stepped outside. But she obviously has dealt with the UCOS. She's dealt primarily with the Hartikovsky appeals, but there's also a, broad, a second appeal by the UCOS shareholders and their, their rights to property that were violated by the Russian state. So she might be able to expand a little bit more on those types of disputes and how they work their way through the European courts. But yeah, I, I just don't know. I don't really do business. It's not really my thing. It, it may well be. But uh, can I say in relation to that, the um, UCOS is particularly interesting because obviously it had money and a lot of money. And you know, if you look at the representation and the and the cases that are dealt with the you know the the high level stuff, uh, and I I would be very surprised if that the kind of abuses which were occurring, if someone actually did the research into it, wasn't occurring in relation to very little people with less money um, and less profile, um, in all sorts of situations and in in many countries, not not just Russia, and uh, so I think it's important to make that distinction between the people that, that you know make the headlines because of their resources and the violations which occur at, at every single level, really. Question down here. Thanks, um, I have two quick questions. Um, Joanna, if could you give some perspective? You mentioned the case of um, England not complying mm. with this one case, and we know obviously that there are many cases where Russia is not complying. Yeah. Are, are there many other cases uh, where uh, countries are not complying. Could you give uh, maybe help us with yeah. that, with the Russian perspective? And Natasha, when you s talk about um, increasing the focus on implementation as opposed to filing cases, d uh, could you expand on that a little bit? And do you mean, uh, in terms of a strategy, that uh, when you know a case is going to be filed, you focus then on the implementation of that case, or is it a more general focus on all the needs of the systemic implementation of the system? Um, I in terms of general problems of implementation, um, if you again look at the, uh, the broad and longer context, uh, there was a period when, for instance, Italy was uh, you know, top, top of a league table in terms of, of not complying with cases that there was issues with Turkey. It, it's, it's been something which has happened all, all along the way, as, fa as far as I'm aware. I think that the difference, or Certainly from my personal perspective, the difference is that um, particularly in uh, some of the Russian cases, the right to life cases, it, it seems to be so blatant. So if you look particularly at the disappearance and the killing cases, um, we, we tried to get a sense of what kind of compensation was being given, for instance, for an individual that was disappeared or, or killed in recent years. And I think I'm remembering correctly, but it was it's at the moment it's around about 60,000 euros, I think. Um, but that varies from case to case, and there's some really arbitrary decisions within that. But you take that, for instance, as a, a starting point. 
you're if if Russia doesn't comply with with anything else and doesn't make any other changes, you're effectively setting up um, and justifying a system whereby it, it's almost like having a hitman. Fine, I pay sixty grand. I get I think it's about sixty thousand. So that's English slang. Um, and you know you can kill anyone you want to, and that's all you have to do because no one nobody forces you to deal with any of the other issues. And that's I find a really alarming uh, and problematic situation to be in that you can buy off. Um, particular cases that that deal with people's lives, and I think yeah, that's another. Yeah, yeah. I, I know it's not just about the money, but it's about the people that are being affected by it. Yes, and also, uh, you know, potentially quite calculatedly. I think. Mm. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm not Russian, and I don't, I've got it. It's, it's reasonably recent to me, but the, but that that's what strikes me about it is that the ability to financially buy out almost it, it, it has that impression, which obviously for for any justice system is a very uncomfortable mm. feeling. Natasha, uh, implementation Implement generally or specifically? Uh, I, to my opinion, switching to implementation could have two approaches. The first one is uh, to work on already happened judgments mm -hmm. and trying to implement general measures which are exist in already happened judgments. So this is one strategy. The second strategy is uh, to work on new cases, but not keeping in mind only uh, complain, um, filing complaints and uh, submission, su submitting the complaints and taking the decision, but also uh, further implementation in terms of general measures. And during this process, uh, uh, trying to achieve as much as possible to be included in the judgment, in the final judgment, measures which are somehow connected to the general measures and systematic mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we call that a test case. We yes. find the right case. We, it's perfect in terms of fact and law. If we want to change something, uh, we actually set it up. So it's, it's a well thought out case that, that you hope then has a judgment that is targeted at specific uh, ab abuses or system systematic problems. Okay, okay. that's uh, clear. Um, Anton. Thank you. I have a question to Joanna. As a UK citizen and a judge, although part-time, can you <laughs> tell us if, um, obviously it took a long time for the United Kingdom to incorporate the European Convention into domestic law and uh, what happened after 1998 yeah. Human Rights Act I did um, were there any trainings for the judges um, on the on the issue of domestic application of the convention thank yeah. you that, that's really interesting actually and it's quite a, a good parallel so uh, I'm trying to remember when I uh, when I came out of law school. I'm, I can't quite remember the dates, but the um, the Human Rights Act wasn't yet in force. And, and just for anyone that wouldn't know, the Human Rights Act effectively brought into British law the um, European Convention, the rights of the European Convention on Human Rights, in a very specific way that I'm not going to go into now because it, it's very complicated. But it was designed to ensure that parliamentary sovereignty w wasn't a affected uh, as, uh, as as much as possible in those circumstances. Prior to that, um, there was no specific implementation in British law, but as you will probably know, there is no British constitution in any event, so it's, it's all a very murky area. But in any event, leaving that aside, which would take a whole semester to deal with, <laughs> um, from 1998 onwards, th the Human Rights Act came into force, which meant that the rights were in domestic law. And Anton's completely right that at that stage there were vast amounts of trainings for everybody um, everywhere at every level um, about what that meant. But as a practitioner, um, prior to that happening and after that happening, if you went, because I was reasonably junior at that stage, if you tip up to a, a, d a district level court equivalent or, or, or even if you're in the Crown Court at the lower level and said, I want to ask for Article 6 argument to be made here, Judges would look at you, at, at, you know, with great disdain, and say, "You trying to suggest that prior to the Human Rights Act, I didn't have a fair trial in my courts," and you'd end up in quite a sort of tricky mm -hmm. uh, situations as a result. Um, uh, that was reasonably short-lived, and and actually, the impact of 
of the Human Rights Act has been quite impressive, uh, in my view, um, on uh, the, the jurisprudence and the, and the development in, in the UK. Um, personally, I'm not sure the training has made a huge difference. I think it was just about people becoming familiar with um, a new um, mechanism or, or a new t a new piece of legislation which which had already always been informed um, within our case law but uh, now had to be um, dealt with in a different way and perhaps a, a stronger way and uh, yeah I, I think probably to, to the advantage of the, the legal system as a whole but others disagree on that <laughs> hence the debate whether to pull out so a question back there Um, Kathy Kalsman, uh, just a, a quick question as to whether or not there's any statistical analysis of the areas in which Russia um, pays compensa compensation as opposed to actually implementing the decisions. Yeah, I'm sure there is. Uh, and I don't know if anyone better informed than me could tell you where. But uh, uh, certainly in, in, my in terms of our caseload, it's, it's on everything. <laughs> <laughs> As, as a general, Ru Russia has a very positive record in terms of paying the actual fines. Yeah, okay, always but it's, it's, it's they, they pay, and in fact, they when when it looks like they're going to lose a case, they actually will settle before it actually gets to a final hearing, so that they can avoid the, the statistic of it showing that they're about to lose a case. Um, obviously, the introducing the underlying measures that deal with the particular issue at hand is is where Russia has not really addressed. They haven't addressed the problem of the non-execution of decisions. And that's why the most recent attempt by the European Court to issue a pilot judgment where they said, you know, because it, it, it involves the actual first case that went to involve the decision before the European Court. Um, and it turned out that three years after the fact, he still hadn't managed to get paid. So they essentially ins insisted that Russia not only address this specific case, but to address cases like the non similar cases where non payment was an issue and address that backlog as well. So th whereas Russia generally has paid the fines, uh, it hasn't addressed the underlying conditions that, have that lead to these problems within the Russian judicial system. And, and the court encourages the parties to settle. Does, it, does anyone know, is there a large number of settlements so that the, the judgments are just the tip of the iceberg or? Well, I was surprised to hear Will saying that there there's this move towards settlement in cases that Russia's going to lose because, I mean, it may be in different areas that mm -hmm. than the ones we've been looking at, but I haven't seen any any evidence of that in very overwhelming cases, particularly the, the you know the right to life type cases. Um, but the your original question in terms of the types of cases, I I think probably one distinction worth making is that it, it's not just about cases where investigations are required because you could understand perhaps a reluctance to expose your um, uh, armed force, members of the armed forces to uh, prosecution and, and imprisonment if, if the orders had come from the top to do certain things which then result in judgments from the court. But it is not just that. W one good example of a failure um, is an ERAC case, which I think is called Fadeeva, but I always get my Russian names muddled up because I'm not making much progress in my Russian studies. But um, that was an environmental case where somebody was found to be within far too close to a factory which was pumping out um, uh, toxic material, to put it in broad terms. And um, she was due to be moved outside the boundary that was said to be safe. And under domestic law, she was inside the, ba the safe boundary, sorry, inside, too close to the factory. Even the domestic law agreed with that. Um, when it came to the failure to implement and the, can the committee ministers looking at that failure to do that, the Russian response was, because uh, she hadn't been moved at all, oh no, the boundary's been moved now. And so the, the area which was said to be safe for human inhabitation had just been changed. So it gives you an example of the extent of cases where there's just a disinterest and a, an apathy, um, to put it charitably, in terms of actually putting concrete things in place. We have time for one last question back here uh, on the show. Yeah, um, I a question for Natasha, perhaps. Um, 
To what extent have the Russian NGOs been successful in establishing a link uh, with um, international NGOs that are working to, uh, in common purpose or uh, hypothetically in uh, common purpose, and uh, has there been a, a successful network established or is the um, line of demarcation <laughs> uh, very clear? Uh, I would say that uh, some Russian NGOs uh, have very good links with the international human rights NGOs and even have uh, joint projects uh, <coughs> uh, with uh, they exist uh, from one side uh, Russian NGOs and from other side uh, is international or big uh, foreign NGOs uh, like uh, the program of uh, Human Rights Memorial Center and uh, Yehrak, uh, like a uh, Nizhny uh, Novgorod committee and uh, their program with uh, interrights uh, or joint activities with the interrights and Article 19. Uh, so there is the uh, good established links between some Russian NGOs and international NGOs, but I would not say that there is uh, um a good formed network of Russian and international NGOs. So it's uh, more like uh, one NGOs here and one NGOs where connection. That's a, a great question for me to add uh, a conclusion and a little advertisement. Um, the Jackson Foundation is obviously an NGO and it's one of the major focuses of our work to work with the Russian human rights NGOs. And um, that's been a, 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 a long history of grant making and seminars and teaching and bringing um, people even to the United States to be trained. And it's something I'll just tell you that uh, we're very focused on doing even more of. Um, so at least from our perspective uh, here in, in the United States, um, we're, we're trying to help. And, and, Will, you could speak to that, too. I mean, the National Endowment, that was a major, um, was it not? Right. I mean, there, there are a variety of different NGOs in the United States that are actively involved. And, and in specific instances, and I know at the National Endowment for Democracy, for example, it has supported individual groups that, are, that have tried to uh, prepare appeals to the European Court and train people about the European Court as well. So uh, that's also something that's very active in the United States. So, um, a very stimulating panel, um, fascinating. Um, th you know, the last panel today is going to be talking about the future. I, 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 I've hesitated because of the specific expertise and the questions I wanted to ask of, of our three panelists here to ask about the future. So, I'll have to wait to this afternoon to hear uh, more about uh, what we foresee 10 years down the road. I want to thank uh, Joanna and Will and Natasha for just a very, very interesting morning. Thank you. Thank you.